I trust you've had a good week with food and perhaps with family and enjoying a little pause on the normal pace of life to reflect on what it meant that God became man, to be born as a baby in Bethlehem, to become a sin bearer on a cross at Calvary, to draw people to himself in faith by his grace. This has been a a good week for our family. It's fun to be back together and to be in the book of Romans. I'd like to invite you to turn to Romans 15. And while this is a new chapter in our verse-by-verse exposition of the book of Romans, it is the same topic that we've been on through chapter 14. And we will be on this same topic one more week as this issue of Christian preferences takes us through chapter 15 and verse 13. This morning we're looking at Romans 15, 1 to 6. This is preferring each other in matters of preference, part 5. And you remember that we're dealing with issues where we are diverse in our thinking. These are matters not of command. These are not matters of clear-cut applications of biblical principles, but matters of preference, what we might call gray areas or areas of indifference. And the principles taught here in Romans 14 and 15 could apply to any number, any variety of things we might seek to address. Should Christians vaccinate their children? What is God's view of child rearing or nutrition or finances or dieting? What is the right choice for schooling your kids? What kind of dating should Christians pursue? What kinds of activities are allowed on Sundays? Should women work outside the home? What is God's view of dieting, supplements, exercise, essential oils? We could go through a number of lists of things that can potentially divide Christians, particularly because they are areas of difference in our opinions, differences in areas of applications of biblical thoughts and ideas, and sometimes Christians are tempted to raise any one of these areas of preference or indifference to a level of conviction that provides fertile ground for contempt or judgmentalism. Opportunity for us to think through areas of Christian freedom as superimposed onto other people's lives as measures of their spiritual health. What is laid out for us in Romans 14 and 15 have been some tremendous helps in giving us aid to think through these things. This morning, we're going to continue more help in this area. Paul will give us three avenues of help for God-glorifying unity in our gray area diversity. And at the end of our section, down in verse 6, there is a so that, a purpose. And this is in the prayer that Paul prays at the end of this paragraph. He says, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of the great reasons stated here in this text why we must pursue unity in the midst of our diversity over gray area issues or freedom issues or preferential issues in the body of Christ. There will always be differences among us on these things, but it glorifies God for us to have the same mindset towards one another, one of selflessness and love and preferential treatment. Let's read the text before us this morning, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 15. God writes through the Apostle Paul, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, 
so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll look at this section in three parts, what we might call three avenues of help. And the first avenue of help is a pair of commands or a set of commands for us to obey. We're going to look at commands to obey, examples to follow, and prayers to pray to help us pursue unity in our diversity in gray areas. First, let's look at these commands to obey. And the commands listed out here are, of course, in addition to everything we've looked at in verse 14. Notice what Paul says, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength, and we who are strong ought not just please ourselves. And verse 2, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good and for edification. Now, the first command here is that the strong, and by the way, the strong here are those who are confident before the Lord in an area of preference. The weak are those who are not confident that in faith they can please the Lord in that area of preference. And remember the example that Paul has been touching on from time to time in this section is the area of food. And in the first century in Rome, you had a collection of Jews and Gentiles together from various backgrounds, and food was a difficult issue. For those who had grown up under mosaic dietary restrictions, eating food that was not kosher was problematic, even though it was a legitimate freedom for Christians in the New Covenant era. It could be a difficult hang-up for those who had spent their whole lives eating kosher or eating things under mosaic dietary restrictions. To see another Christian in the church freely eating pork chops when my whole life I've been told it's wrong to eat pork chops would be a burden on a conscience that was tender before the Lord and wanted to please the Lord. And that conscience needed to be re-educated, bolstered with scriptural truth before it was violated by the reckless behavior of believers who felt free in that area. Likewise, Gentiles who'd come out of a pagan idolatrous background and always got their stakes from the pagan idol temple, and they knew that this stake was dedicated to an idol, and when I eat it, I'm participating in idol worship. They come to Christ, and they are to learn that an idol is nothing. And the meat sacrifice to idols, it's just meat and you can eat it. But if I think that it's idolatrous and tainted by idolatry and I eat it anyway, then it's sin. That's the example that Paul's been developing in this section. And so the strong are those who are confident in the Lord that they could participate in this area of Christian freedom. And they can worship him in faith in doing so. And the weak are those who are not there Yet, not confident that in faith they can please the Lord in this activity. And notice what Paul says to the strong. We who are the strong, and Paul is including himself in that. He's acknowledging that eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols is legitimately okay before the Lord. But we who are the strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. That is, those who are the powerful are to bear along the powerless in this area. And Paul does not say you are to bear with them, as in to tolerate them. Oh, I can put up with you. I can put up with your little foibles, your little scruples about not eating meat. I can tolerate you. That's not what Paul says here. Uh, The word here, to bear, means to carry carry the weak, to to pick up the load and the weakness of the weak and put it on your shoulder. It's like when you take your kids hiking. Have you done this, taken your little ones on the hiking trails around us? And it begins by every kid carries his own little backpack and has his jacket and and his bottle of water. And pretty soon you find out that you are carrying the water bottle. And then you're putting the jacket into your own backpack, and then lo and behold, you're carrying the backpack, and then finally, you're just carrying the kid. (laughs) That is the idea of bearing the weaknesses here. The strong are to carry the weak. This word is used this way in Galatians 6 too. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Christ. 
The strong are not to be in condescension of the weak. They're not to be in judgment of the weak. They're not to feel an air of superiority over the weak. I've arrived and you haven't. Look, buck up and carry your own load and we can all be happier together and live by my preferences. No, the strong are to carry the burdens of the weak. And so the strong are enjoined here not to ask the question, what am I allowed to do? Is it okay? Is it permissible? Is this gray area okay for me? Or even, is it enjoyable? But the question that ought to be on every Christian's mind in the body of Christ in one of these preferential areas is, how can I help my brother follow Christ conscientiously? Right? We looked at this in chapter 14. Don't destroy your brother for food. Don't ruin his tender conscience by recklessly going after what you believe is permissible or enjoyable. But here the strong must carry the burden of abstaining for love. So for a first century Roman Christian, not under Mosaic law, convinced that idols are nothing, to love his brothers whose consciences are troubled by tainted and unclean meat, what would it look like to carry his burden? To take up his burden and carry it. It might mean don't bring your pork chop to the church picnic. To go without. It's far better than ruining your brother for the sake of food. And Paul lays the responsibility here with the strong to initiate a bridge building over the gulf of our preferential differences. And this is contra the Roman culture of strength. Uh, The Roman mindset was right by might. To the victor go the spoils. The strongest survive. That was not to be the case in the church. The strong were to use their strength to look out for the weak and to seek to carry their burdens. And to do so without looking down on them or having an air of superiority, but only in love. What does it mean to live this out. It means to have your eyes open, to look around, to be attentive to the needs of my brothers, looking for a burden to carry. So the first question on my mind is not, can I do this as a Christian, but how can I love my brothers and sisters in Christ? If you believe you are mature in Christ so that you can freely participate in some gray area, but you're giving no thought to how your life affects your brother whose faith is hurt by your freedom, then you are like the gym rat weightlifter who bulks up for selfies but fails to lift a finger to help someone in need or someone in danger. You're living to please yourself rather than employing your strength, your knowledge, or your so-called maturity to benefit others in the body of Christ. You are doing the wrong kind of bodybuilding. Verse 2, Paul says, each of us is to please his neighbor. And Paul, by saying each of us here, probably expands beyond the category of the strong to include the strong and the weak. All of us, each one of us individually, ought to have as a motivation, please your neighbor. That is to work hard to benefit the others. Neighbor in this context is clearly a reference to fellow believers in the local assembly. Rather than be pleasing to self, each is to please his neighbor. And now this is different than being a man pleaser. Uh, Being a man pleaser is sin. It's actually the sin of self-love. I want something from somebody else, and so I manipulate them, or I give them what I think they want so that they'll give me what I want. And you can be a man pleaser out of fear, I'm intimidated by somebody, so I'm not going to ruffle the feathers or stir up the waters because I don't want anybody to be mad at me, right? That's a fear of man kind of man-pleasing. You can be a manipulative man-pleaser, right? How can I flatter somebody? How can I say the right things or do just the right things, avoid the hard conversations to get them to like me more or to get them to do what I want? That kind of man-pleasing is sin, Paul says in Galatians 1.10, am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Am I striving to please men? If I were still striving to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You see, a slave of Christ answers to Christ, does not fear or flatter men, 
but seeks to be pleasing to him. That is not the kind of compromising, man-pleasing Paul is talking about here. Here in Romans, Paul is not speaking of compromising biblical conviction out of self-preservation. He's talking about denying self for the benefit of your brother's spiritual growth. And notice in verse 2 how this pleasing your neighbor is qualified. There's a pair of critical limitations here. You're not just endorsed to do anything that would be pleasing to him. Lots of things could be pleasing that are displeasing to God. Notice the qualifications. Please your neighbor for his good. For his good. Paul has already defined for us what the good is for us in Romans 8.29. Josh worked through that text during the communion message this morning. God is working all things together for our good. What is that good, Romans 8.29? Our conformity to Jesus Christ. That is finalized in eternity is what we were predestined for. And the progressive conformity to Christ is our good in this life. So when Paul is thinking about pleasing your neighbor in the body of Christ, he is speaking about doing that which is for his spiritual benefit, moving him towards Christ's likeness. And the second qualification is for his edification, that is, building him up into maturity in Christ. One author has said these qualifications demand a studied care for others. That is, if I'm going to please my neighbor for his good, I need to be thinking about what would best serve his conformity to Christ and growth in maturity in Christ. And if pleasing self remains my goal, then our differences over preferential areas will forever remain an unbridgeable gulf. When those who are weak see the spiritual good or look for or seek out the spiritual good of the strong rather than seeking to please themselves, the weak will stop being judgmental of everyone who does not imitate their preferences, but long for those whose preferences are different to be pleasing to the Lord in those things. And when the strong look out for the spiritual needs of the weak, unity is built the weak are not destroyed by careless use of Christian freedoms. The weak see that the strong are not spiritually reckless or selfish or godless, but that the differences in preferences come from biblical conviction, and the strong must work to demonstrate that they have a tender conscience and a desire to operate from love towards God and love towards others. And when we do these things, when we follow these explicit instructions from God and how we live out our differences in the body of Christ, these things move us towards a God-glorifying unity. Carry the weaker brother. Please your neighbor rather than please yourself. Now, there's a second avenue of helps for us, and these are examples to follow to move us towards God-glorifying unity in our differences. Look at verses 3 and 4. Paul says, for even Christ did not please himself. As it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Notice that first phrase in verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself. And I just want to read a few passages that emphasize this self-denial of Christ that should be so obvious. I mean, everything about the second person of the Trinity coming to earth to be a sin bearer, to rescue his enemies and make them his own people, fit for eternity in his glorious presence, is a life of self-denial. Listen to these testimonies, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Galatians 2.20, the Son of God loved me and gave himself up for me. Ephesians 5.25, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 1 Peter 2.21, you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. 
Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In 1 Corinthians 10, 33, Paul says, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. What was Paul imitating there in being pleasing to men? Christ's own character. John 5.30, Jesus said, I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In Matthew 8.17, quoting Isaiah 53, he took our infirmities on himself. Even Christ did not please himself. This is an argument from the greater to the lesser. If Christ endured all that he endured to bear the burdens of others for God's glory, then you and I ought to do likewise in the body of Christ. That's Paul's argument here. He bolsters this statement that Christ did not please himself by a quote from Psalm 69. And I want you to keep your marker in Romans 15, but I would invite you to turn to Psalm 69. Here in Romans 15, Paul quotes Psalm 69, 9b, or the second half of verse 9. The reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. And I want to do two things as we look over at Psalm 69. We're going to survey this psalm, but I want us to understand why Paul is willing to use words that David spoke about his own experiences to refer to Christ as if Christ had spoken them. And then I want you to see the connection of what he quotes from Psalm 69 to our responsibility in the body of Christ with one another. So I hope you're looking at Psalm 69. And the New American Standard gives a label for this psalm, a cry of distress and imprecation on adversaries. What's an imprecation? (laughs) That is praying that God would judge his enemies. This is a prayer of David, a psalm of David, a song written by David, and it is a prayer for deliverance from those who, without cause, have made themselves an enemy of God's anointed, God's king, through whom God's covenant promises were coming. Now, you know that David in 2 Samuel 7 was given the promise that Messiah would come through him, that the Messiah King, the one to reign over all things, would come through his line. In a very real sense, David is a prototype of Messiah, or we might say a placeholder of Messiah, as at the time of 2 Samuel 7, the singular occupant of the Messianic line. What does that mean? God made a promise to David that through his line, Messiah would come. The Messiah who would crush the head of the snake. The Messiah that would solve our sin problem. The Messiah who would be king on the earth. The one to whom every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that he is Lord. That Messiah was promised to come through David. And so when you read this psalm, and and there are other psalms like it, where David is crying out in his suffering... This is a lament psalm. He is lamenting his own difficult circumstances. And it may sound like David is lamenting his circumstances because they're all about him. God, I'm having a really hard day. Why is this happening to me? Put it in the hymn book. But there's more going on in this psalm. And I want you to just see a few pieces of this. Notice verse 1. Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. I have sunk in deep mire, there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and a flood overflows me. I am weary with my crying, my throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Those who would destroy me are more powerful, being wrongfully my enemies. What I did not steal, I then have to restore. And this opening stanza in Psalm 69 details David's situation. 
he is being wrongly persecuted by enemies of the office of God's anointed king over Israel. Now, you and I both know that David was a sinner. In fact, later on in this passage, he'll say, God, you know my folly, my wrongs are not hidden from you. David is not Messiah, but David is experiencing some special trials that are not related to his sins. They are unjust persecutions. He has enemies through no fault of his own. In fact, allied against David are enemies opposed to God's purposes and his promises. And when David says in verse 1, the waters have threatened my life, do you understand what's at stake? If David is extinguished, what else is extinguished? The messianic line. 2 Samuel 7 and the covenant promises of God about a Messiah who would come in David's line and save us all from our sins. There's a lot more at stake than David having a hard day here in this psalm. But our own rescue by Messiah is at stake in this. Notice verse 6, May those who wait for you not be ashamed through me, O Lord God of hosts. May those who seek you not be dishonored through me, O God of Israel, because for your sake I have borne reproach. Dishonor has covered my face. I've become estranged from my brothers and an alien to my mother's sons. David is expressing here abandonment, abandonment by friends, surrounding by enemies, a threat to his own life. For what cause? The reproaches made against God. God's enemies have arrayed themselves around David and he is giving voice to something that is true of God's purposes throughout history and has been true as a trajectory throughout the messianic line. And notice verse 9, for zeal for your house has consumed me. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Those are probably familiar words to us. Zeal for your house has consumed me are the words that were said of Jesus at the cleansing of the temple in John 2.17. In fact, Psalm 69 is quoted a dozen times in the New Testament, all referring to Christ and all centering around the sufferings of Messiah. And so when David here in his own experiences is giving voice to God's, uh, to a lament about suffering and abandonment and reproaches, he's also giving voice to what Messiah's own experiences would be. And these things being said of Christ in the New Testament is right in the trajectory of what God intended in this passage. In fact, when you come to the Gospel of John, just before the cleansing of the temple, you have Jesus identified as Messiah in chapter 1, the Son of God in chapter 1, the King of Israel in chapter 1. When you come to chapter 2 and Jesus cleansing the temple, Psalm 69 comes to mind for the disciples, zeal for God's house, zeal for God's name and his program and the place where he dwells and his people has consumed this was true of Jesus the Christ. When you come to Matthew chapter 1, and the genealogy of Christ is traced through David. And when you come to Luke chapter 1, Jesus is the promised one who will sit on David's throne and rule over the house of Israel. All these connections are made of Christ. In fact, already in Romans, we've seen this uh, psalm quoted Look down at verse 22 of Psalm 69. May their table before them become a snare, and when they are in peace, may it become a trap. May their eyes grow dim so they cannot see. Make their loins shake continually, pour out indignation on them. This is that imprecation. This is the David, David's prayer for judgment against God's enemies. And this is not just personal with David. I'm having a hard day. God, obliterate my enemies. 
but God, these enemies are enemies of your promises and the messianic line. It is appropriate that this text is used of those Jews in Jesus' day who rejected Messiah altogether, those responsible for crucifying Messiah. It's appropriate that the words of verse 21, they gave me gall for my food, they gave me vinegar to drink, are used of Christ in his sufferings. It's appropriate that Acts 1.20 uses words from this psalm to describe Judas Iscariot, the one who rejected and gave over Messiah. The psalm turns in verse 32 from lament to trust. The humble have seen it and are glad. You who seek God, let your heart revive. For Yahweh hears the needy. He does not despise his who are prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him. And the psalmist turns from lament to rejoicing in confidence that God will have his way and God will subdue Messiah's enemies and bring God's people to himself. So a threat to the Davidic line meant a threat to Messiah. When Paul quotes this in Romans 15, he ascribes these words to Christ. It is written of Christ, by the way, even that using Christ here. He, he could have said a lot of things. If you want to imitate Jesus, look back at his earthly ministry and do like he did there. But here he says Christ, not Jesus. That is his title, Messiah. And he points to reproaches that Messiah would bear. Nothing new here. When, when Jesus came to earth, he came not to be served, but to serve. And that would mean for the glory of God, bearing the reproach of the enemies of Messiah. Messiah himself came to earth now, not just being vocalized through the words of the placeholder of Messiah in David, but now Messiah himself is here and these words are appropriate. He bears the reproaches of those who were the enemies of God's plan. God's plan to forgive sin. A really remarkable text here. Chrysostom says of this that Jesus had power not to have been reproached. He had power not to have suffered what he did suffer. Do you remember? He could have called angels down and rescued himself from the cross. That was not God's plan. That was not God's plan to bring glory to himself by rescuing sinners by grace. Chrysostom said he could have stopped all of that suffering and all those reproaches had he been minded to look to his own things. And so here Paul employs this really remarkable train of thoughts as an argument from the greater to the lesser. If Jesus Christ could bear the reproaches of the mockers and the enemies of God's program and carry that further, if Jesus could bear our iniquities, if Jesus could bear the wrath of God, do our sin. How much more should you and I be able with one another whom we love, to whom we are connected organically in the body of Christ, how much more should we bear one another's burdens? Do you understand the math on this? An infinitely great and awful bearing compared to just a little one for someone you love. Like your precious little child on a hike who just can't carry her water bottle one more step. You gladly pick it up. And then you pick her up. And you walk. This should be easy by comparison. There are other examples. Look at verse 4. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. I think Paul here is expanding beyond the example of Jesus to other implied examples in Scripture and says whatever Scripture writ, whatever was written in Scripture, whatever was written down in earlier times was written for our instruction. And that instruction is going somewhere. We'll look at it in a moment. But notice the, the, the life of Christ was a preparation for the substitutionary death of Christ, and yet it also included teaching and exemplary behavior. And so when Paul says here, whatever was written beforehand was written for our instruction, he means that, yes, the events of the biblical historical narratives 
happened as part of God's unfolding plan for history. Uh, Those weren't made up moral fairy tales to try to teach us a lesson. No, those people actually existed. They had relationship to God. Uh, They lived by faith. And those who knew him and lived by faith were saved by his grace and are with him even now, alive. They were real people in real relationship to God. But the events themselves were recorded for the benefit of their posterity. For us, for every generation subsequent who gets to read about them. This is the gift of the inscripturation of lives and events. Those things could have happened, and God could have given us a book of doctrinal formulations. He he could have just said, here's the content of what you need to believe. But he included in his scriptural record lives of people and events for our benefit. And we see through them how doctrinal truth and a relationship with God work out in the course of real events. There are many reasons that God wrote the Bible. This isn't the only reason the Bible exists, to teach us how to live. But it's one of the reasons, right? God wrote the scriptures in order to disclose himself. He certainly wrote the scriptures so that sinners would know how to get saved, how to get to heaven, how to be forgiven of their sins. But he also wrote the scriptures, 2 Timothy 3.16, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. That is what Paul has zoomed in on here. This is instruction for the Christian life. In verse 3, David is voicing Messiah's unjust sufferings. That's instructive for us. We are to be like Christ, bearing the burden of caring for one another in the church rather than living for ourselves. And in verse 4, whatever was written implies that there are other examples to follow, other lives and events to be instructed by. And fitting this context, we might think of other examples of men and women in the scriptures who suffered unjustly or who bore great burdens in the plan and purpose of God, sustained by faith in God, in devotion to God for the glory of God. Why did Christ suffer ultimately? For the glory of God. What is the ultimate motivation for people like Abraham or Job or Joseph or Daniel and his friends or Elizabeth or Mary? The plan and purposes and character and glory of God is the ultimate motivation. Notice the chain here in verse 4. Instruction, perseverance, encouragement, hope. We are to be instructed. We are to be students of what God has written. We don't read the Bible for mere academic curiosity. Again, there are many purposes for which we come to the Scripture primarily to know Him. But the purpose stated here is to learn how to bear up under difficulty. And specifically in this context, how to carry the burdens of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And this instruction has a purpose, so that through perseverance, so that through perseverance, we might have hope. You see that in verse 4? What is perseverance? Perseverance is endurance. It is faith or trust in God multiplied by time. I'm trusting God now, and my circumstance isn't changing. I'm trusting God with the next step. My circumstance still hasn't changed, and I'm trusting him with the next step too. That is endurance. Obeying God, trusting God, entrusting my life to God when my circumstance isn't changing. What Eugene Peterson calls a long obedience in the same direction. Keep trusting him. And the scriptures, the instruction that comes from the scriptures, gives us help for endurance. Endurance is that discipline of sitting under a trial in persevering faith, and it has the effect of strengthening our hope. This endurance from the instruction of the scriptures produces and strengthens hope. And we know this, this is what James says, the testing of your faith produces endurance. Endurance is to have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's hard to wait. It's hard to wait under a trial when your circumstance isn't changing, but impatience kills hope. 
Endurance has a job to do, sitting under a difficult, unchanging circumstance and trusting yourself to God who is good and who does good, holding on to the truths of Scripture, being instructed by examples in Scripture. That kind of endurance has a God-intended result, strengthened faith and real, genuine hope. Listen, endurance is strenuous exercise, but the result of it is spiritual strength. Again, notice this chain, instruction so that we have perseverance that gives us hope and encouragement of the scriptures that bring about hope. This encouragement that comes from the scriptures. Think about the word encouragement. Encouragement. That is that which gives you courage. And what is it that gives us courage in the midst of difficult situations? The character of God? The promises of God, the personal and effective love of God. We get courage from an eternal perspective in the scriptures. We get encouragement from the promise of God in the great reversal. Tears turn to laughter, sorrows to joys, or as Keith Green used to sing, trials turn to gold. That is our light and momentary troubles producing for us an eternal weight of glory which far outweighs them all. And this is the essence of the hope that Paul has in mind here. Hope in this verse is not wishful thinking. It is rather a solid confidence in what God has said. Do you you understand that God's promises for the future are real, literal, actual history? They just haven't happened yet. And biblical hope, unlike I hope I get a red wagon for Christmas and your hopes were dashed a couple days ago. It's not wishful thinking. It is a solid confidence in what God has said, and you can bank on it. Now, can you have this hope without learning the lessons of endurance? Your avenue to hope is strangulated if you have not gone through the exercise of perseverance. Can you have this hope with your Bible closed? Well, this text says this hope comes through the encouragement of the scriptures. Do you find yourself regularly hopeless about your circumstances? Do you find yourself readily complaining or despairing about your situation? Friends, there are solutions to these things. You've got to read your Bible, you've got to read the Old Testament. You've got to read those things written in previous times for our benefit. You've got to get a hold of the hope that comes through the scriptures. These examples to follow should give us the help and encouragement we need to serve each other in the body of Christ, to not live for ourselves, but for God's honor to live for the spiritual needs of others. It might have seemed like a burden in the first century to deny yourself the use of a legitimate freedom might have seemed like a burden to not eat that steak burrito at the church potluck for the sake of a weaker brother. But in light of Jesus bearing our sorrows, bearing the weight of God's wrath against sin, bearing the reproach of his enemies, I can carry this one. I can carry this one whom I love and to whom I am joined in the body of Christ. And instructed by what was written down in scripture, I can persevere in self-denial for the benefit of others and for the glory of God. There are commands to obey here for us, examples to follow. And then finally, there are prayers to pray in verses 5 and 6. And this is instructive. If you haven't yet taken a survey of the prayers of the Apostle Paul and let them inform you about your own prayer life, I would encourage you to do so. Here's one little example. Paul says, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. So that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Perseverance by trials, encouragement from the scriptures. Here in this prayer, Paul says, God, you are the giver of encouragement. You are the giver of perseverance. You're the source of these things and you use the means of trials and the means of your scriptures to equip our hearts with these necessary resources. It's a great thing to pray for one another, that believers... Using these resources from God 
would be given greater measures of these things so that they would be of the same mind with one another. And the same mind here is a union of thinking, uh, the same mindset. It's not unanimity of ideas and preferences. We've seen all the differences of those in these texts. Those things will not go away in this lifetime. It's not unanimity of ideas, but it is the same mindset towards one another in our difference. A union of affection, of purpose, of attitude, of selflessness, of harmony. It creates, in fact, a symphony in our differences of praise to God. And notice the standard here of this mindset, according to Messiah Jesus, according to Christ Jesus. That is, His Christ-like disposition towards us is to be our model and our standard of our disposition towards one another. Selflessness. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, Paul says in Philippians 2. And that Paul prays for this. May God give these things. This is a gift of God to be earnestly sought for, prayed for, longed for, with a purpose. So that, so that, verse 6, we may be in one accord. With one accord, we may with one voice glorify. This is the doxological purpose to our harmonious unity, to our denial of self that we lay down our own preferences, our own self-will, our condescension, our judgmentalism, lay it all aside so that we might enjoy a harmonious unity so that with one voice we praise and glorify God. If this is our prayer, it makes it hard to be selfish. It's hard to pray this prayer and then go try to live for self in the body of Christ. Let's pray. God, this is our prayer. May you who give perseverance and encouragement grant that we would be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord we may with one voice glorify you, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is our longing, O oh God. That is our prayer, that we would be like your Son in this way, that we would empty self, that we would look for, be attentive to, and be eager to meet the needs of those around us, that we would not elevate our own desires and our own preferences to the destruction of brothers and sisters in Christ, but that we would be eager, that we would all together with one voice praise and glorify you. We ask it in Jesus' name.